Perfect. All right, well, uh, welcome to our webinar. We're gonna talk about prostate cancer survivorship tonight. Uh, this is brought to you by Cleveland Clinic and the Center for Men's Health. Thanks for taking the time to join us. We'll go over a few different things tonight. We'll talk about treatment decisions and prostate cancer, the urinary side effects of prostate cancer treatment, and the sexual side effects of prostate cancer treatment. I'll be your moderator for the evening. My name is Brad Gill. I'm one of the surgeons and faculty in the Center for Men's Health. I practice primarily on the east side, as well as at the main campus. And I'm fortunate to be joined tonight by two of our other experts, Peter Bayich, who is one of our masters of reconstruction and genital urinary implants. Uh, he specializes in erectile dysfunction, urinary incontinence and Peyronie's disease or penile curvature. We're also fortunate to have Sarah Vidge with us. She is our interim center director for the Center of Men's Health. And she also specializes in erectile dysfunction, as well as infertility and the management of low testosterone. So without further ado, we'll go ahead and jump into our content here. If you look at things statistically, prostate cancer is one of the most common malignancies or cancers that impacts men. Modern statistics will show that this parallels and may surpass the number of breast cancer cases in women as time goes by. However, as many of you know, there's a lot of pink ribbons out there, but unfortunately, not really anything to draw attention to prostate cancer. It's a relatively under-discussed subject amongst men, so part of what we want to do tonight is help spur a conversation about prostate cancer treatment and some of the side effects it may have and the solutions that we have to help manage those. Prostate cancer survivorship is something that refers to really not only the patient, but the patient support network. Patients obviously are the primary focus of survivorship care and management of the effects of prostate cancer treatment. However, we know that a cancer diagnosis not only impacts the man, but also his family and friends and loved ones. So when we think about survivorship, we also think about ways to help everyone manage how the disease may impact them. The phases of survivorship really start with the diagnosis of the disease. It's not just an afterthought after you've had treatment. Once that diagnosis happens, your urology team starts to care for you and help you understand not only the condition, but also the treatment options. With prostate cancer, we know there's a variety of ways to manage the condition. And that's our job as urologists to help men figure out which one is best for them. After treatment, there can be side effects of the different approaches to management, surgery and radiation being two of the main ones. And that's what our focus will be tonight is how to help manage side effects that may occur after prostate cancer treatment. Prostate cancer treatments, as we know, can range from radiation to surgery to active surveillance or monitoring. There's also ablative therapies that destroy the prostate tissue. No treatment is without side effects. It's an important thing to know. A lot of men that we see in our practices come in with regret from choosing one treatment over another. They wonder if they could have had a different outcome or a different pathway and not had to manage side effects. One of the biggest things that I tell men and my own family members who have had prostate cancer and had it treated is that no matter which treatment you choose, there's gonna be some side effects or consequences of the treatment along the way. And those can range from bladder irritation, urinary leakage, and erectile dysfunction to anxiety or stress if you're managing cancer with active surveillance, to urinary leakage and fistulas and blockages of urinary flow with some of the other approaches. So different things can happen to a man and part of the, the continuum of care that a urologist provides is helping them figure out how to navigate those and manage those side effects if they occur. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Bayich now, and he'll go over some of the urinary issues that can happen after prostate cancer treatment. Peter. Thank you so much, Brad. So just a real quick review of some pertinent anatomy. So 
the bladder is an organ that stores urine. And when a man urinates, that urine passes from the bladder through a channel that passes through the prostate gland and then into the urethra and the penis and out of the body. Now the prostate is about a walnut sized organ and the primary function of it is to produce the majority of the fluid that is in the semen. M much of the fluid that's not sperm, that keeps sperm alive comes from the prostate. Um, you know, uh, men who are older and are not trying to have a child, the prostate doesn't really serve any major purpose, um, but unfortunately sometimes does cause problems like prostate cancer. Next slide. So when we think about urinary symptoms that might come as a consequence of prostate cancer treatment, um, several studies have been done comparing urinary symptoms that might come from surgery as compared to radiation. And interestingly, by about the 15 year mark, next slide, the rates of, sorry, go back one, yeah. The rates of bothersome leakage or dripping urine is actually nearly identical between men who have had their prostate removed and men who have had radiation therapy. Next slide. Some of the urinary symptoms a man might experience after prostate cancer treatment include stress urinary incontinence. This is leakage that occurs primarily due to physical activity and with exertion things like lifting, exercising, sneezing, and coughing. This is not unlike the incontinence that women might experience after childbirth, okay? Urge incontinence is a different kind of leakage. This is that gotta go, gotta go type of leakage where a man might not make it to the bathroom on time when he gets the urge to go. So it's associated with this overwhelming need to urinate. There's also overflow incontinence. And what that means is that the tank, the bladder is completely full and can no longer fit any urine within. So as the bladder tries to fill more by urine draining down from the kidneys, a little bit of urine simultaneously escapes. So you can have this kind of continuous urinary leakage. Next slide. Uh, the last type of incontinence that's worth mentioning is called climacteria or arousal incontinence. This is a type of leakage that occurs when a man becomes sexually aroused or with uh, sexual stimulation or orgasm. Interestingly, this has been reported in some studies to occur in up to 70% of men who have undergone certain types of prostate cancer treatment. Next slide. Okay, next slide. Now, when the prostate is removed, the bladder is reconnected to the urethra. So we have a new connection that sometimes can develop scar tissue and become narrow. This might in some men be a potential cause of some of the urinary issues if present. Next slide. There's also other types of scar tissue that can happen at any point in the urethra, okay? In the, for men who still have their prostate, you can get uh, scar tissue within the urethra that passes through the prostate. This is something that can sometimes happen in men who have had radiation seeds implanted, uh, but you can also get scar tissue that occurs even within the urethra in the penis or even at the tip of the penis, right at the opening. Next slide. It's important to realize that all of these urinary issues, although there's quite a wide variety of them, do have very effective treatments available. Next slide. When it comes to urge incontinence, that's that gotta go type of incontinence, we can find improvement with things like behavioral, behavioral, sorry, or dietary changes, medications, and sometimes either or even surgical or procedural treatments. Stress incontinence, on the other hand, we have treatments available, including devices like clamps and catheters, and even surgical treatments, which can be very effective in addressing these issues. 
For overflow incontinence, many times the treatment is surgery. Getting back to those clamps and catheters for stress incontinence, these are some of the more conservative options that exist. One pictured here on the right is called a Cunningham or external clamp. This is like a soft foam clip, like a chip clip almost, that's placed on the penis shaft and compresses the urethra. It's something that's worn either all the time or perhaps just when a man might want to have more physical exertion and might want to avoid leakage. They're relatively inexpensive um, and widely available. Another option would be a catheter. Pictured here on the left is an external catheter, also known as a condom catheter, which allows urine to drain through a tube into a bag that can be concealed under the pants attached to the leg. Internal catheters pass through the urethra into the bladder. There are pluses and minuses to these. Some of the pluses are that they're non-invasive, they don't involve surgery, and they do tend to work well. However, some of the disadvantages are that they're bulky, they may be cumbersome, they may cause some skin irritation from the pressure, which can lead to wounds. Sometimes they might even damage the urethra or be related or be associated with urinary infections, particularly indwelling catheters. As far as surgical options for stress incontinence, we essentially have two different types. One is called a male urethral sling, and the other is an artificial urinary sphincter. The male urethral sling is a very effective treatment, particularly for men who have mild or moderate incontinence. It's minimally invasive. It's an outpatient procedure that you're completely asleep for, and it's associated with minimal pain. With this procedure, continence is immediately restored by placing a piece of mesh, which is a sling, across the urethra to apply additional pressure that helps you hold the urine in. This is a completely internal device that's placed through a small opening between the scrotum and the anus. Once again, with you completely asleep and under anesthesia, and it's done uh, in an outpatient setting, meaning you go home the same day. Next slide. Men who are good candidates for the sling procedure include those who have had a prior prostate removal, those men who have mild to moderate incontinence, that means three pads per day or less, and who are dry, primarily dry at night. Men who have had a history of radiation may not be the best candidates for the sling. Many centers also offer slings for men who have specifically arousal and climax related incontinence. However, it's important to note that this was not the initial intent of this sling. So it's a, considered an off-label use of the product. Next slide. The artificial urinary sphincter is another type of device to control urinary continence. This, if you imagine it, almost like a blood pressure cuff that wraps around the urethra and that cuff is inflated around the clock, applying pressure to the urethra and compressing it so that urine cannot escape. There's also a pump that it's connected to, which is concealed down in the scrotal sac. Can't see the pump, but a man feels for it. And by giving that pump a couple squeezes, the cuff would open up and allow urine to pass through. After about 30 seconds, that cuff automatically reinflates and compresses the urethra again. This means that a man would have to squeeze the pump every time he wants to urinate. Some other urinary issues that a man might experience after prostate cancer treatment include radiation cystitis, which is essentially radiation damage to the bladder tissues. Prostate or bladder stones may also occur, particularly in men who might have some blockage of urinary flow related to the various treatments. And also painful urination, which can come from a wide variety of causes. Next slide. A fistula is an abnormal 
connection between two body cavities where there shouldn't be a connection. So some men who undergo radiation therapy may develop a connection between the, the rectum or the gastrointestinal tract and the urethra. So that can mean that some urine might pass through to the rectum or that some bacteria might pass from the rectum into the urinary tract and could cause infections. All right, thank you, Peter, for that awesome overview of the urinary issues and some of the treatments. Now, we'll take a brief pause here. Um, a question that came up in the chat uh, as you were wrapping up there was about Kegel exercises and uh, if those are an option for urinary control. Um, anything to, to add on those? So Kegel exercises are something that we pretty much always instruct men to do after prostate removal. Um, and it's very effective in helping rehabilitate that, what we call the sphincter muscle, which is the urinary continence muscle that men need to rely on after prostate removal. Uh, however, sometimes that may not be enough. Uh, for many men, it, it is enough. Um, particularly men who undergo some additional treatments like radiation after prostate removal uh, might find more urinary leakage despite Kegels. So although it is something that we recommend to all men who are having stress incontinence and it can be very effective, unfortunately for many men, it is not sufficient. And that's when we start to consider some of the more involved treatment options, um, particularly if the more conservative measures don't seem to work. Thank you. All right, we're gonna shift gears a little bit here now. Uh, we're gonna turn things over to Dr. Sarah Vidge and she'll review with us some of the sexual function issues that can happen with prostate cancer treatment and the solutions that we have available to help our patients with those. Sarah. All right, hello everybody, good evening. Um, I uh, appreciate the introduction from Dr. Gill and the nice summary from Dr. Bayich. So I'm gonna talk about sexual function issues today, which are a very important, is a very important topic in terms of survivorship and, and certainly very relevant to, um, to prostate cancer patients. Next slide. So, you know, we saw a similar slide when we, um, when Dr. Bayach was talking about uh, urinary control after treatment for, uh, for prostate cancer. And you can see this is a very similar table looking at um, uh, sexual function with regards to um, erections that are sufficient for intercourse and sort of degree of bother um, by the bisexual uh, dysfunction and patients who have undergone a um, prostatectomy or radiation treatment for um, for prostate cancer. And you can see um, at, at five years, 75% uh, of men have um, erections that are insufficient for intercourse after prostatectomy and about 72% after radiation. So unfortunately it is um, you know, a problematic side effect that does affect a lot of our patients despite um, you know, our best efforts to try to minimize um, you know, this downstream effect. And then you can look uh, below, if you look at bother, again, a good percentage of, of patients um, at, at five years out are also um, are bothered by these symptoms, which is uh, you know, pretty understandable. Next slide. So um, about 60,000 prostatectomies are uh, performed every year. And uh, erectile dysfunction exists in, in anywhere from 10 to 90% of patients. So um, the, quality of a man's erection going into surgery um, is also important as we think about what his erections might look at look like coming out of surgery. So, so the worse the erectile dysfunction at baseline preoperatively, um, the less likely that they these patients will uh, you know, recover to, to satisfactory um, erectile function postoperatively. So if we look at predictors Oh, sorry, go back. Predictors of erectile dysfunction um, after uh, radical prostatectomy, that's RP. Um, older age at time of surgery, which makes some sense because erectile function does tend to decline with age. Uh, diabetes, which is a known risk factor for erectile dysfunction. 
And then non-nerve sparing surgery, I'll get into that a little bit more, but um, essentially the nerves to, um, to generate an erection run right next to the prostate gland. And so if, if due to a patient's uh, cancer, sort of the severity and the location of their cancer, if the surgeon is unable to, uh, to spare those nerves and, and leave them alone, the erection function after surgery is, is gonna be worse. Next slide. So briefly, that the mechanism of of an erection. I think a lot of men don't a lot of men uh, don't have a great understanding of this. So um, the the cycle is started in the brain. So um, when a man is aroused, there um, the nervous system is essentially what starts the erection cycle, and it's the nerves to the penile tissue that bring that send the signals essentially to bring arterial blood into the two erection chambers in the in the penis. So you can see here the two sort of oval chambers on the top are called the corpora cavernosa. And then the bottom chamber uh, on the bottom is the urethra or the, the P-tube. And it's blood filling these erection chambers, the corpora, uh, that lead to a firm rigid erection. And then the out, sort of elastic covering of those um, uh, corpora cause some compression on the veins so that the blood doesn't leave the penis until um, until ejaculation and climax occur. So in order for an um, erection to happen, the um, there needs to be arousal, the brain needs to sort of do its part, the nerves need to be intact, and the blood vessels uh, to the penis uh, need to be healthy. Uh, next slide. So, um, other factors that can uh, so impact erections and sexual function that, that are sort of relevant to our prostate cancer, pa cancer patients, as Dr. Bayich covered, um, incontinence, uh, sp specifically the climacteria, which is incontinence that occurs during climax, um, can affect a man's se sexual function and, uh, you know, lead to some um, uh, insecurity about, you know, ability to perform. And again, that can impact the sexual function cycle. Uh, penile shortening can occur um, in some men after prostatectomy because a portion of the urethra is removed, and so the penis can sort of be pulled in and they can have some um, perceived shortening. And then the psychological impact and the stress of the cancer diagnosis and the recovery, you know, maybe dealing with incontinence, as I mentioned, um, uh, some, you know, performance anxiety related to all of these issues. Um, will impact the uh, the sexual function cycle. Again, as I mentioned, the brain is just such an important player. Um, depression, which um, ha has been known to coexist uh, in, in cancer patients, um, treatments for depression can affect sexual function. And then additional cancer treatments. So there are men who undergo prostatectomy who then based on their, um, their pathology and their PSA trends um, may require additional treatments such as radiation, and then um, uh, hormonal therapy, which can cause the testosterone intentionally to drop to very low. And so there's sort of a few um, being hit from a few different um, angles, essentially, when it comes to sexual function. Next slide. So if we look at um, sexual function after prostatectomy, um, generally, because the nerves are what are damaged at the time of surgery, nerves can regenerate and heal, fortunately, but that recovery can take some time. So um, we, you know, we do like to give men, uh, you know, about 18 months to two years to recover. Um, and, uh, and that's because, you know, they may not be doing well initially, but uh, with some time, um, they may, you know, respond to, to medications, et cetera. Um, and uh, the other important thing to know, and, and um, I think Dr. Baich sort of alluded to this, is that when, when you undergo treatment for prostatectomy, the, um, the ejaculation is going to change, and the, the majority of them will, will really have no ejaculate at all because it comes from the prostate and then the seminal vesicles, which are two glands that sit behind the prostate and the bladder, and the seminal vesicles are responsible for the majority of what makes up a man's ejaculate. And... Um, Sexual desire and orgasm, fortunately, are less affected by surgery. Um, so generally, those uh, you know can be maintained. Although some of the the issues that I mentioned on the on the previous so slide um, uh, can affect these things. You know things like um, uh, depression, performance, anxiety, uh, etc. Next slide. 
Um, so uh, fortunately, it is uh, the penile shortening issue. Um, I know that always uh, sort of raises eyebrows, but fortunately, it's not as common um, for patients to, to note this and um, orgasmic function generally is intact and um, the uh, orgasm intensity, um, it can be decreased. But again, for most patients, particularly if we can optimize their erections, this is not, a, not an issue. And then um, rarely patients will complain of painful orgasm after surgery, but these are all um, less common. Next slide. So penile uh, rehabilitation is a concept that was um, introduced in the, in the late 1990s. And this is when um, the idea that you could spare the nerves alongside the prostate and still be able to cure men of their prostate cancer when that idea really came to fruition. And now it's pretty much standard of care as long as it's safe from a cancer standpoint. The idea was to try to enhance nerve recovery by um, using PD-5 inhibitors, which is the name, the, the um, class of medications like Viagra, Cialis, uh, Levitra, Stendra, you can see a lot of commercials for these medications, um, to use these drugs early on to, to help um, essentially boost nerve recovery. Um, the results and the outcomes of this have been mixed. We do use them uh, clinically, you know, um, on, a, on a regular basis, but uh, the data to support it is not overwhelming. Next slide. So um, additionally, in addition to the, the um, medications, there are um, vacuum erection devices that um, you can see pictured here. It's a device that's essentially placed over the penis to pull uh, blood into the penis and get, sort of start the, um, the process of those, the corpora, the erection chambers that I mentioned, uh, filling with blood. Because if they are not filling with blood for 18 months, um, they can sort of contract. And so there's some evidence that this may minimize uh, penile length loss, um, and there may be some uh, earlier return of erections. Um, and this really may be um, a compounded effect if used alongside uh, medications like Viagra and Cialis. Next slide. So if we look at medical treatment um, for patients with persistent erectile dysfunction after surgery, um, you know, many of you are probably familiar with the, the pills, Viagra, Levitra, Cialis, uh, Stendra. Um, these medications will help some men, but only if the system that I mentioned anatomically in the beginning is intact or at least partially intact. So there has to be some nerve function and some intact uh, blood flow for these medications to work. And um, there are some contraindications to these medications, which, um, you know, oftentimes do coexist in our um, older prostate cancer patients, like history of a recent heart attack or stroke, frequent chest pain, heart failure, um, the use of um, nitrates, which are the sublingual tablets um, that patients take for chest pain, um, a rare condition of the eye called retinitis pigmentosa, and then um, poorly controlled blood pressure. Next slide. Um, another uh, medical treatment option um, is a medication called the alprostadil, which is a dilator of blood vessels um, that can be given intraurethrally. It's a suppository that's placed inside the urethra. The effic efficacy is mixed, um, about uh, 40 to 60 percent. Um, unfortunately, it can cause some urethral burning. Um, it may cause pain for the sexual partner. Um, and has been um, shown to cause uh, some lower extremity genital and, and buttock pain. But this is an option that, that um, some patients do elect to try. Next slide. And then um, the final medical treatment option is what are called intracavernosal injections. So um, again, remember the corpora cavernosa are the erection chambers, and there are medications, uh, a, a few different uh, medications that can be injected into the uh, corpora directly. So the patient actually is taught to do them do this themselves. Uh, it's actually relatively straightforward. Um, and the drugs cause essentially um, dilation of the, the blood vessels to, to pull blood in. Um, and the efficacy is reasonable, although it depends um, sort of on the degree of erectile dysfunction and the cause of the erectile dysfunction. Um, the dropout rate with this therapy, unfortunately, is high, partially due to cost of the drugs. They have short uh, shelf lives, so they expire relatively quickly. Um, they have to be purchased typically from compounding pharmacies. You can't get these drugs very easily from sort of your local CVS, so there's some prescribing um, challenges. 
Um, but, but for some patients, it's a very reliable treatment option. Um, some side effects that can um, lead to penile pain, hematoma, or a little bruise or blood collection at the injection site, which is more common in patients with blood thitters. Um, priapism is an erection lasting uh, longer than four hours. is a very rare side effect, but a concerning one. And then um, the injection site, if you repeatedly inject, you cause some scarring of the corpora, which can lead to um, curvature or bend of the penis, also known as Peyronie's disease. So some um, contraindications, uh, sickle cell anemia, um, patients who are prone to bleed, um, that's what coagulopathy refers to, um, schizophrenia, very poor dexterity, so sort of unable to actually, you know, inject the, the drug, and very severe uh, cardiovascular disease. Uh, next slide. Um, vacuum device, I sort of talked about with regards to the, um, the penile re rehabilitation program. The, the nice thing about this is there's no medication, so there's really um, no systemic side effects. It's safe. It's well tolerated. It can be expensive, and the, um, the uh, results in terms of erection quality is not always completely reliable. Next slide. So shockwave therapy is a sort of a, a new um, treatment option that's on the horizon. Um, it's uh, not yet FDA approved, therefore it's not covered by insurance. Um, it's an office-based procedure. Shockwave is used for a lot of different conditions um, sort of throughout the body, non-neurologic conditions. And um, it's not painful and the device is essentially just placed on the penis and um, uh, um, these shockwaves enter the tissue. We don't really fully understand the mechanism yet. Um, of how this works, but um, the thought is that it causes some healing and regeneration. It's really best for men with mild to moderate ED. Um, it's not curative. The, the data is sort of still um, uh, not fully mature for us to be able to offer this, again, sort of an on-label setting. We do offer it at the Cleveland Clinic. Um, it is, uh, again, off-label, so it's expensive. It's about $1,800 for six treatments, and we do offer this at, at three sites sort of um, spread around. Next slide. And then surgical treatments. Um, I'm going to talk about a penile implant, which is shown here. Uh, next slide. So hopefully this animation will play. Um, I can get it to. So there's a little bit of an intro here. So a penile implant, I'll just sort of talk while, while you watch, um, is a, it's a surgical procedure to place, just, just like the sling and the artificial urinary sphincter. Um, it is really sort of our, our only curative treatment, um, meaning uh, it will allow men to be sexually active. Um, and you can see here, this man is squeezing the pump that's placed between the testicles inside his body. And when he pumps that pump, the fluid is passing from a reservoir, which typically sits next to the bladder or in the abdominal wall. Um, and that fluid then passes uh, into the cylinders and the, the penis will get um, rigid. And in some cases, depending on the device, um, may gain a little bit of length. Um, so there, it's relatively easy to use. Um, it was first developed in the 1970s. They're very durable. Um, at, at 10 years, 80% are still working. And at uh, 20 years, 60% are still working. And the satisfaction rate is very high, um, both with patients and partners. You can see over, over 95% um, for patient satisfaction and uh, partner satisfaction. Next slide. So the benefits of the penile implant, um, the erection, uh, is hard enough for penetration. It does allow uh, sexual intercourse. Ejaculation is going to be unaffected. Orgasm is going to be unaffected. The device is basically just giving a, um, a, a mechanical erection to allow for penetration. Um, it does feel natural uh, to the patient and the partner. The sensitivity really should be the same. Um, it is easy to use once, once you sort of get used to it and are taught. Um, it will always work. It can be used sort of as much um, or as little as the patient wants. Um, and there's no cost, you know, cost per use. So the, the cost is really upfront in placing the device. The disadvantage is it is a surgery. So you have to undergo anesthesia and, and um, you know, there, there's always risk with surgery. Um, there is a recovery period after surgery where we do not allow patients to use the device, although it's relatively short, three to six weeks, depending on, on surgeon preference and patient preference. 
Um, it's generally not reversible. So if a patient is dissatisfied with it, um, there's, there's, you can't really uh, successfully sort of go back once you're committed. It can be removed, but the options for sexual function at that point are very limited. There can be mechanical failures. Um, again, I, I mentioned that the great majority of these are working at 10 and even 20 years, so that's rare. And then surgical complications um, are rare, but of course, with every uh, intervention that we do, there are risks. Next slide. All right. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Vidge, for giving us a great overview there on the changes to sexual function and treatment opportunities um, to help men deal with those. So, you know, to wrap things up here, uh, really just to recap, we want everybody to know that no matter which way you choose to manage your prostate cancer, there can be side effects of treatment. And they don't happen to everybody. We saw that they happen with variable rates uh, across the various options, but a lot of times, the end point after years is about the same in terms of problems with sexual function or problems with urinary function. So the treatments, while you may have a honeymoon period with radiation and less side effects up front, compared to surgery, once you get out a few years, you really wind up in the same spot. All of the symptoms, nearly all of the symptoms, of prostate cancer treatment are things that a urologist can help a patient manage. So that is, is really what we want uh, to drive home today is that we have good options to help men get back quality of life if that's been impaired or challenged by urinary leakage or problems in the bedroom. So with that, I'd like to transition us over to uh, the discussion portion of the webinar tonight. Um, feel free to post any questions you have in the uh, chat box. I'll read those off and we can go over them uh, with the experts here. Otherwise, uh, we have a few um, questions or case scenarios of our own uh, that we can go over just to spur some discussion and uh, see if it brings anything to mind. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll put up our information here uh, for reference and uh, Open it up for any questions from the audience. Okay, um, I just had a question sent to me in uh, chat and the question was uh, in terms of erections recovering after uh, prostate cancer surgery, what does that time frame look like? And are there things that you can do to, to help maximize chances of recovery? Um, why don't we, uh, we'll kick this one to Dr. Bayich since uh, Dr. Vidge gave us the overview. Yeah, so <clears throat> in general, um, you know, the, the studies that have been done show that that recovery of the erections, like Dr. Vidge talked about, can take up to um, about a year and a half to even two years, okay? Now, if a man has absolutely zero erections and zero response to any sort of treatment by that one year mark, it's relatively unlikely or less likely that he's gonna have a full recovery. Um, so it's, we, we kind of look at things on a case-by-case -case basis. As far as optimizing your chances of recovery, um, you know, there, there are a couple of factors. You know, one is um, what was your overall health and erectile function like beforehand, just like Dr. Vidge talked about, one of the predictors of how good or bad your erections are going to be after surgery is how were they before surgery? If they were excellent, you know, then certainly your likelihood of coming back to that is going to be higher. Um, we haven't really identified the best way of maximizing a man's chances of recovering that function. Um, but we do know that 80% of men don't go back necessarily to where they started. The hope is that, you know, a man who has normal erectile function before surgery can get to a point where 
he's still able to have sexual activity without a medication or perhaps with the help of a medication. Um, but many, many of us use oral medications or plus or minus vacuum devices in that immediate after prostate removal period to try to enhance recovery. But unfortunately, nothing has really been proven to facilitate that. So many times it's just a waiting game and trying to sequentially try various options until we find a solution uh, that works for that man. Anybody else have any other comments on that from the group? Dr. Vidge, any any thoughts? Um, do you have any, you know, cutoffs or or you know time points where you think it's too early to to try a pill or to try an injection or something along those lines? You know, I think it's always a discussion with the individual patient. You know, a, a patient who goes into prostate cancer treatment with very very poor erectile function, I think sitting and waiting for two years for recovery is is sort of doing him a disservice. Um, so, you know, I think um, sort of when when we pull the trigger on which therapies is um, sort of, it, you know, can be very individualized. And I sort of mentioned the the, re, the rehabilitation um, sort of pathway as to Dr. Bayich and, you know, the data to support it is, is reasonable and there's not a major downside, assuming that the patient, you know, doesn't have a contraindication to uh, medications like Viagra and Cialis. And even right. sometimes, you know, injections and things like that, we can incorporate you know, well before two years if a man is not having any sort of response. I generally, as long as it's okay with the surgeon who did the prostate removal, I'll often start an oral medication even a month after uh, to try to see if we get any sort of improvement. And if after, you know, even a couple months of trying that if a man is not having any function, then we can consider even adding injections if he's interested in that option. Um, of the options we discussed today, the only one that's a definitive permanent thing is the implant. And that's generally the one that we wanna make sure that we give adequate time to see how much a man will recover before going to that option, because once we go to that, we can't necessarily go back. Now, if a man were had bad erectile dysfunction before surgery, and it's very unlikely that he's going to have much recovery at all, which can be due to various factors, including the severity of the cancer and how much surrounding tissue had to be removed at the time of removal, we might consider doing even that earlier on. So it's really a case by case basis. We had a, another question come in here. Um, how long? Should a, a man stay in active surveillance before requiring one of these uh, types of treatments? Um, I'm not sure if that refers to the, the type of prostate cancer treatment or uh, treatment for the side effects, but I think we can branch off and, and really talk about both of those. Um, I will tackle the, you know, the prostate cancer end of that. So. If a man is on active surveillance and the PSA is is progressing, that'll usually trigger us urologists to work things up a little further and, and recheck the extent of the cancer. And that may involve MRIs, uh, biopsies, sometimes even genetic or genomic testing of the prostate cancer tissue. And what we're trying to figure out is how aggressive that cancer could be. So you know, a time frame for remaining on active surveillance before going to prostate cancer treatment uh, really varies by the individual patient and how that cancer behaves over time. Um, if, it, if it advances, if it becomes more aggressive, then we generally move to treatment. However, we've had patients who have been on active surveillance for you know the better part of a decade, if not uh, a decade already. Um, you know, it is a relatively newer approach. Um, so the you know other side of that um question regarding uh moving on to treatments if you're on active surveillance um if a guy is on active surveillance he can develop erectile dysfunction uh, urinary symptoms that you know are associated with prostate size or age uh, just like any other man uh, you know who who doesn't have prostate cancer so um you know from that end uh, I'll, I'll kick it over to uh, dr vidge um, you know, 
for a guy who's on active surveillance, who's having uh, troubles with erections, you know, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I think sort of the whole premise of active surveillance is we've learned that many prostate cancers, um, you know, patients will die with them, not of not of it, die with prostate cancer, not of prostate cancer, and that not not all of that prostate cancer needs treatment. And so if we can spare men the side effects of treatment that we've covered tonight and not affect their longevity, that that's, you know, a, um, a, a good pathway. And we didn't, you know, we sort of covered this a little bit tonight just in the context of prostate cancer, but we have a lot of options to help men with regards to their sexual function and, um, you know, urinary control, um, urinary frequency as they age. I mean, that's sort of a whole, um, a big part of what all of all of us do. So, um, you know, the, the active surveillance decision in terms of when to pull the trigger is, is generally made based on um, the cancer piece of it and sort of when we feel, you know, between doctor and patient that um, sort of the, the, the watchful approach is no longer um, optimal and that it may be time to to trigger treatment. How about you, uh, Dr. Bige, for, for, you know, a guy who's on active surveillance, who's having um, troubles with his erection, um, you know, I, I, I can't help but think of the above the shoulder factor of that, that cancer diagnosis, but what, um, what's kind of your take on that situation? Uh, do you have a, a preferred favorite approach or uh, what are your thoughts? Yeah, it's a great and important question. I think we we need to realize that across the board, um, you know, when we look at the general population, the average guys out there who have erectile dysfunction, the most common causes of erectile dysfunction have nothing to do with the prostate. Okay, and those most common causes are high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, and tobacco use, all things that cause cardiovascular disease. Many men who come to my office think that erectile dysfunction comes from some disorder of the prostate. And that's not a, not true. Um, really, it's a, oftentimes a blood flow problem. Now, in men who have had treatment for prostate cancer, it's a little bit different. That's also a very common other cause of ED. For men who are on active surveillance, I generally treat them just like men who are not. Um, we go, you know, sequentially. We I, First of all, I present men with all of the available treatment options for erectile dysfunction that we discussed essentially all of them today. And then using a shared decision-making approach, we talk about the pluses and minuses to each option. And then a man chooses what option might be best for him. We used to pretty much require men to try self-injection therapy before they would even be considered a candidate for penile implant many, many years ago. And now we realize that you know, many men don't love the idea of needles. And in fact, of men who go through with that treatment, 75% of them quit within two years. So that's why it's important that we kind of set realistic expectations and also the, discuss the pluses and minuses to each treatment. Generally, most men start with oral medications, but for men, who, if that doesn't work, then we consider many of these other options or if they have a side effect or just don't want to have to rely on a pill. So, you know, the active surveillance is always something that we keep in the back of our mind and we make sure a man is having his appropriate testing and things like that. Um, the only scenario where it would otherwise change what I'm doing is in a man who has low testosterone. Um, we might consider avoiding giving him testosterone replacement if he's on surveillance, particularly for, you know, a, a cancer that has more potential of becoming something dangerous. Although sometimes even men on active surveillance can be treated with testosterone in certain circumstances. Anybody have any other comments on that? I, I think you're spot on, you know, when it comes to um, testosterone, especially in, in advanced prostate cancer. Um, it, it's something we want to, you know, generally be mindful of because um, those advanced prostate cancers really feed off of that. And, and the basis of treatment is to to block the testosterone. All right, uh, let's take a look here, uh, see if we have any other questions. Okay. So, um, I'm gonna throw out a, you know, a hypothetical patient here just for the sake of discussion. Um, 
So we have a very nice gentleman uh, who's come in. He's had a um, you know radiation treatment for his prostate cancer. Um, had a little difficulty peeing at first while that was happening. You know, generally the prostate swells up and, and blocks things. But a few months later, uh, everything cools off. Um, stream is kind of back to normal, but he finds that he's he's just peeing all the time. He's going and going and going. Um, and you, you talk to him, you find out that, uh, you know, he loves coffee, he's a big, uh, big fan of sweet tea. Um, and, uh, you know, he, he otherwise uh, is a fairly healthy guy. So um, any thoughts on that one? Dr. Ridge. Yeah, so um, urinary symptoms, you know, in, in all men, in particular, particular men who have received treatment for prostate cancer can be due to several different factors. And when we think about it, we try to think about, is this a, a bladder issue? So is there some bladder instability, bladder overactivity, um, uh, potentially um, some irritation of the bladder lining from the radiation treatment, sort of a nearby organ? Um, you know, are they having a, a urinary tract infection that's causing, you know, urinary frequencies? We think about bladder processes and then we think about the prostate. Is there um, inflammation, as Dr. Gill alluded to, from the radiation therapy causing blockage? Maybe they're in overflow incontinence. And so we're fortunate that we have a lot of different in-office sort of non-invasive ways to tease some of this out. So it's sort of um, looking at the um, strength of the stream, using a Euroflow test, uh, doing a post um, uh, void uh, residual where we check how much urine is left over after a man pees. And once we can sort of tease out where we think the, the issue is, we can start um, targeting treatments. And sometimes it's not very clear and we have to do more invasive testing, putting a, a camera inside the urethra. We have a urodynamics um, testing where we can actually measure the bladder um, as it contracts, as it's filling, and as a man empties or a woman. Um, so we have a lot at our disposal to help sort of tease some of this out and, and figure out what the underlying etiology is that will then drive treatment. Any uh, anything to add, Dr. Biage? Any thoughts on your end? No, I mean I think that's a it's a very important case to present because it's something that. Uh, we do see quite commonly, um, you know, there's, there's a wide variety of treatments available, but I think first step is always to get as much information as possible. And similar to what I mentioned about ED, then we discuss the various things that we can try to optimize, including what a man is eating and drinking, you know, whether there may be any muscle component that might need physical therapy involved and then oral medications and sometimes even procedures. Um, so whatever these issues are, you know, it's important for men to realize that they're common and can commonly be associated with some of the treatments they've had. And there are always ways that we can work to optimize that. All right, we just uh, got another question in here. Uh, actually, an excellent question. Um, will ejaculate improve after time following radiation treatment? Or is the prostate completely destroyed? I can kind of tackle that one unless somebody else has a. Um, so it's a great question. Um, and this is also one of those areas that unfortunately gets worse the more time passes from when the radiation was delivered, you know, moving forward. Um, it's generally like, I guess it depends on what the issue is. A man can certainly have a decreased volume of ejaculation, he can have a change in the consistency of what comes out. Uh, some of the changes that can happen to the ejaculate can be age related, but certainly others can also be as a result of the radiation. Generally, the radiation damage type changes that happen to the prostate and affect ejaculation are unlikely to improve over time, um, particularly those relating to volume and, you know, uh, changes in the consistency of the ejaculate. Now, there might be other reasons why a man might have uh, a condition called retrograde ejaculation, where the semen actually flows backwards into the bladder. Sometimes that can even be a side effect of medications. Um, so this is also something that we would kind of want to try to tease apart exactly what 
contributing factors might exist, try to identify any reversible causes. Uh, but I do see a fair number of men who have had some change in that uh, related to radiation. And unfortunately, it just seems to get worse over time. Yeah, I, I think it's a, a stiffening of those tissues and the ducts clog up and then you can't produce quite as much um, semen, the cells that produce that, you know, uh, also kind of die off with radiation. I, I agree with you with time. I, I think that's definitely something that declines, but it's also something that declines with uh, with aging as well. So, you know, with, with just age alone, uh, aside from prostate cancer, you can expect uh, ejaculate to, to sort of decrease in uh, volume. The other thing I would just add, I don't know that I made this clear in my presentation, but um, when we when we talk about the sort of sexual function cycle in a male, ejaculation and climax tend to occur together, but they're they're physiologically very different processes. So ejaculation is a a muscle contraction that causes these glands that we mentioned to to empty into the urethra, and you know the, the biological purpose of it is to cause a pregnancy. And it tends to occur at the same time as climax, which is a central, you know, a brain process. That's the the pleasure that goes along with orgasm. So there are men that have very poor ejaculate, as we've been discussing, who have completely intact orgasm and have very, um, you know, satisfactory um, sex lives. And there are men who have ejaculation intact and do not have orgasm. That's less common in this patient population. But just important to know that the two are not the same. And um, the treatments to sort of help um, to to address the problems related to them can be different. All right, I'm not seeing any other uh, questions here, and we're coming up on the hour. Um, so, um, nope, I take it back. One last question here. We'll make this the last one for the night. Um, all right. Um, three months after prostatectomy, uh, there's no improvement in erectile dysfunction so far. Um, should a man be worried? Is this a bad sign or may it just take a little bit longer uh, for the erectile function to recover? Um, erections before surgery were good, but sometimes a little bit of Viagra was needed. Any thoughts there? Dr. Rich? Sure. Yes, yeah, so I, I would certainly not be discouraged at three months. Um, you know, it's important to have a conversation with your surgeon about, um, you know, whether there was nerve sparing that occurred. If there's no nerve sparing at all, if the nerves had to be taken due to the the cancer, um, then things are likely to not improve. But if there was nerve sparing at three months, that the nerves are definitely still healing and there may be recovery. And going into prostatectomy requiring the occasional Viagra, I would call that pretty strong erections going into surgery. And I think that's, you know, you may end up still requiring some assistance with some of the mechanisms we mentioned to, um, to get, you know, a completely firm erection, but certainly at three months, not time to give up hope. Um, and, you know, you could consider some of those, the, the rehabilitation um, options that we discussed. Yeah, I totally agree. I think at this at this stage, if without any improvement with oral medications, it would certainly be a reasonable time to start considering things like the vacuum device or maybe even injection therapy. Um, you know, there's no reason that you necessarily need to stick with the current just oral medications for a full 18 months. Um, however, you know, it's important to recognize that that recovery really can take that long. Uh, but there are ways in the meantime, while you wait, that we can try to, you know, restore that function so you can have a normal sex life in the meantime. All right. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bidge, Dr. Bayich, for sharing your time with us tonight. We really appreciate it. Um, thank you to all of our participants for tuning in. Hopefully this was helpful for you. Uh, we appreciate your questions and stimulating our discussion tonight. Um, our information is here on the screen. Feel free to call. Uh, let us know if we can help you. Uh, we'd be happy to see you in the office to manage whatever really you need help with. Um, take care and enjoy the start of your fall. Stay healthy and uh, thanks again 
good to see you.